All right. So our first question is from Garrett. And he says, you mentioned that fructose is much better absorbed alongside glucose. So I'm wondering if I can balance the glucose to fructose ratio by adding a bit of white rice to my higher fructose fruit. Would this also make the fruit not high FODMAP? So this is a great question. There's a lot of detailed things to get into here as far as how fructose gets absorbed in the intestines, whether we need to be concerned about it, feeding bacteria and being concerned about it as a FODMAP as it potentially can be depending on how well we're absorbing it. It can then go on to feed bacteria. So we'll discuss that and also how you can determine if you need to be concerned about this in the fruits that you're eating based on the fructose to glucose ratio. And we'll also talk about why the typical categorization here of the fruits or foods that are excessively high in fructose isn't necessarily relevant. And there are some pretty significant issues there and disagreements we have in terms of some of the application of this. So we'll be talking about all of that, but as a starting place, we first just need to discuss how fructose actually gets absorbed in the intestines because that will then inform how we can best absorb it and make sure that it's not being und undigested and then heading on to, uh, or unabsorbed and then heading on to feed bacteria. So Mike, why don't you start us off with that? Sure. So I guess the first thing to understand is how fructose is actually absorbed in the intestine. And so there's two major transporters that control the absorption of fructose in the intestine. And it's actually a bit different than the absorption of glucose. So the major transporter of fructose for in the intestine is GLUT5. So this is a receptor that takes fructose up from the lumen of the intestine and brings it into the intestinal cell. And then there's also GLUT2, which is seen with uh, kind of like a co-transport with glucose that brings fructose again into the intestinal cell. And then also the GLUT2 moves the fructose from the intestinal cell into portal circulation. So you have these little receptors on the cells or these little kind of transporters on the cells that take up the carbohydrates and move them across the intestine. Now, some things to keep in mind here is that the, the amount of these transporters and their functions are not stagnant overall. So basically when you're exposed to higher fructose intakes, your ability to fructose to absorb fructose actually increases due to an increased expression of these different transporters and things along these lines. So basically, when you first start having fructose, you're not having a lot of fructose in your diet. When you when you increase it a bit, the amount that you'll absorb will increase over time due to changes in these these uh, transporters. At the same time, if there's a lot of intestinal inflammation and damage going on, you can also have a negative impact on the ability to actually uptake these carbohydrates due to adjustments in te uh, intestinal function uh, with, related to some of the effects on these transporters. So the state of the intestine and the substrate that's being put into the intestine determine how well the intestine is able to absorb certain substrate like fructose. And fructose is a little bit different than glucose because in a large proportion of people, the ability to absorb fructose is actually can be a bit impaired um, in without having adequate amounts of glucose present. So if you don't have adequate amounts of glucose present, their ideal ratio is one to one glucose to fructose. And now, when you start to get over that, when you start to have more fructose over glucose, so the ratio becomes in favor of fructose, that's where you start to see people have issues, but there's a wide range of tolerance. Some people, five grams of fructose is a problem over glucose, and other people, it's upwards of 50 or more, 50 or more grams of fructose in a sitting. So there's also this in individual variance in response to fructose overall, and, there's a, and so there's a lot of moving parts going on. For myself personally, the way I like to determine with clients how this works is, you know, I'm not trying to, to do a test to measure their GLUT5 receptor activity. <laughs> it's more just how much like you have foods that have higher or lower fructose and you see if you have a negative response to them or not. You want to make sure that it is like a fructose component because I will talk about some of the high fructose containing foods that people tend to have issues with also have FODMAPs. And so with that said, you want to make sure it's not the FODMAPs like a sugar alcohol, like sorbitol that we would see in apples or versus the fructose itself. And so to this answer this question specifically, can you add a bit of glucose in the form of maybe dextrose or white rice to other foods that are higher in fructose and it will help to in improve intestinal absorption of fructose? I think so, especially if your tolerance for it is low. You're one of the people close to that five grams of fructose over glucose. 
But at the same time, if the problem is not fructose related, if it's more of an issue of a FODMAP, like a, like a sugar alcohol, like sorbitol or lactose or whatever the well, lactose wouldn't count, but it's, it's more of a, a function of one of these FODMAPs, then the adding sugar or adding glucose wouldn't necessarily help that. It's just in the case of fructose. That's why it's important to understand with the different foods, what type of fermentable fibers they have in them as well. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is that the major problem that I see with fructose malabsorption, especially, so with fruits, I think this is less of an issue because of the polyphenol compounds and fibers present. But when you just, when we look at the studies and you do a bunch of free fructose feeding, or you have high sources of free fructose that doesn't have a lot of polyphenol components and fibers, then the bacteria in the gut with the free fructose feeding can start to produce endotoxin. And this starts to create inflammatory responses and issues overall. So that's kind of the, that would be my rundown on fructose specifically. Yeah. And when you're talking about the free fructose in that latter context, you're talking about excessive free fructose over the amount of glucose present, right? Well, I'm, I'm saying even if they were just to feed them pure fructose, because that's what happens in the studies is like, right. here's a 75 gram bolus of pure fructose in like in a solution. And let's just see how it goes. And it's like, <laughs> It's probably going to go bad for the vast majority of people when you look at the fructose malabsorption studies and then mm. to then try to understand what's going on metabolically without understanding that piece is pretty questionable because it's like you're not this is not about absorption now this is about how are you dealing with endotoxin and malabsorption of fructose in these in the different studies. Right, right, exactly. And that's pretty much never going to be a good thing. And so that's what even led to, like, has, is one of the main things that have led us to talk about this previously is looking at the sugar and fructose research. In the vast majority of time, whether it's for rats or humans, they're giving free, pure fructose, way in excess of glucose or sometimes with zero glucose, as you said. And then this is a question of just purely feeding bacteria, endotoxin production, and the impacts of that rather than it having anything to do with fructose. And so that's what you know has led to i think the question of uh, that's being asked here because as we've said you need to have glucose alongside the fructose to absorb it and so just to get into that in a little bit of detail as you said there are two primary uh receptors that help to transport fructose in the intestines there's the glute 5 and the glute 2 the, the glute 5 is always there and it just transports fructose and it's a pretty low capacity relative to the GLUT2, which has a much higher capacity uh, for transporting fructose. And the GLUT2 receptor is basically recruited when a different receptor, the SGLT1 receptor, is active and is tra transporting glucose. So that's what leads to, that is why having the glucose alongside the fructose helps. Basically, it is it increases the activity of the SGLT1 transporter, which then helps to recruit the GLUT2 transporter, which allows for increased fructose absorption. And this is important, right? This is why feeding excess fructose can be an issue. But as you were saying, the amount of excess fructose that is an issue will vary considerably, right? Could be as little as five grams on the much worse side or as high as over 50 grams on the other side. And it's going to vary, as you said, based on gut health, you know, bacterial issues, uh, general inflammatory state, thyroid function, metabolism, all of that. And so that then, when we're looking at specific foods, we need to consider all these things, right? We need to consider our particular tolerance. As you said, testing is generally the best way to identify that. But the problem with testing, as you said, is most of these foods that have excess fructose don't only have excess fructose. They have other potentially fermentable carbohydrates as well. And a good way to test it would be exactly what Garrett was saying, which is you bring in some extra glucose alongside it and see if that helps with the digestion symptoms that you're getting, let's say from an apple. If it does help, then we know in our case, it was an excess fructose issue and a fructose malabsorption issue. If it doesn't help, then we know some other fermentable carbohydrate or some other aspect of the food that was causing the digestive issue. So that's kind of the, the big picture concept here. It's also worth mentioning that so having the glucose to fructose in a one-to-one -one ratio is almost always enough to fully prevent any fructose malabsorption. Uh, but the, there's actually, like you can get away with a bit more than that. So the, because of the way that the recruitment happens, you can get away, let's say if you have 25 grams of glucose and 
uh, a little bit extra fructose, let's say 30 or 35 grams, that is often better than just having the five to 10 grams of free fructose with zero glucose. There's a little, the, the glucose helps in more than a one-to-one ratio, but again, it's really hard to identify because of the way that the studies are done. There's so much different variability in the different protocols and the people that are being looked at. And, and there, there's just such variation there, which is why you have a range of anywhere from five to over 50 grams of free fructose before it becomes an issue. So a lot of variables here, but it's also worth considering that if you're eating something that maybe it has five to 10 grams of free of excess free fructose when you're having, you know, 60 grams of carbs, that might not be an issue, even if you have an issue with a five to 10 grams of pure fructose. Although also, how do you even know that unless you were just trying pure free fructose, which almost no one does. So uh, just different kind of intricacies here that are worth considering. And uh, but it is worth, again, mentioning here that having some glucose is very helpful.